All right. Hello, everyone. I am so delighted to welcome you to our show, Caring for Your Pets. And this is where you can learn more about how to simply, easily, and compassionately keep your pet healthy and happy. My name is Burns Galang or Burns Berry, your host for the show. And now, if you have a dog or dogs and have spent time with them and experienced their love, then this is for you because today our talk will be just about dogs. And so I am honored to bring you our guest, Jessie Kirk. Now, let me tell you something about Jessie. She is a certified trainer with almost 20 years of professional experience. And she is the owner of Howling Moon Pet Care. And she works with a lot of virtual clients all over the US. Jessie has a 14-year-old Chinese crested powder puff, which is amazing. And 14 years is quite an age. <laughs> she also enjoyed a lot of rescue dogs and show dogs over the years. And she is very much committed to help you have a better relationship with your pet. And she uses positive reinforcement training methods. So without further ado, let's all learn from her. Hi, Jessie. Hey. It's great to be with you today. I'm so happy that Zuri and I could be here. Oh, great um, to have you here. And Zuri. I'm so excited to, to help people uh, enjoy their pets uh, and care for them in a, a positive way. Wonderful. I love that. And uh, all right. Uh, so I want to know, can you share with us your journey on how you became an expert dog trainer? Yes, actually, uh, the journey started for me when I was a child, I would say, because I trained my very first dog when I was nine years old. Um, I took several AKC classes. I had an Airedale Terrier, um, and he was my world. Uh, and uh, then I went on to college, and uh, I worked at several vet's offices and became a dog groomer. Um, and when I was in college, I had a dog that had some severe separation anxiety, resource guarding, um, aggression issues, and it was very challenging um, to deal with. Uh, and I don't know that I had ever worked with a dog quite like that before. And um, it really inspired me to learn more about training. Um, so I started taking classes at a local training facility um, and then I started working there as an assistant and uh, eventually I became a certified dog trainer and an instructor. Um, and that's sort of how it all happened, but I have loved dogs and, and training dogs since I was a child. Wonderful. It looks like you really have it in you from an early age. <laughs> yeah. yeah. And it's really interesting how a dog can really change our lives and lead us to. Yes. Absolutely. I definitely would say that the dog I had in college um, is responsible for me becoming a dog trainer because it was such an eye opener for me because I think a lot of times we have easy dogs and we say, oh, it's so easy to train a dog, but then we may have a dog that comes into our life that is a little more challenging and then you really have an opportunity to learn and grow um, with that dog. Wow, that's that's beautiful, and uh, yeah, sounds like um, it's really about the uh, the connection, and and from your story, it's uh, it's very inspiring how much how much patience and how much love you have for the dog in order to you know have that really beautiful relationship, and uh, now you're an expert dog trainer. Yeah, that's that's uh, wonderful to know, and um, yeah, can you tell us something about Howling Moon Pet Care. It's a, it's a very interesting name. Yes. Yeah, so um, Howling Moon Pet Care, uh, it was actually the name what came about because Zuri has, was the original mascot uh, when I started the company. And um, he and his uh, sister, who has now passed away, they would uh, howl on cue. Um, so a lot of times we would go to events and he would do tricks for people. And um, one of his big tricks was howling uh, for people. Um, and so that's sort of how the name came about. Um, and uh, I also went to NC State University, which their mascot is a wolf that is howling. Um, so uh, that's how we came up with the name for Howling Moon Pet Care. 
Um, we are a team of certified dog trainers. Um, we do offer virtual sessions, um, but we also offer in-home private lessons uh, for the Raleigh-Durham area in North Carolina. And we also have a board and train program for puppies. All right, that's wonderful. Thank you for sharing that. And, uh, yeah. and when it comes to uh, training dogs, what is, your, what is the philosophy that you live by? Yeah, so, um, you know, it's kind of funny because uh, I always say that I am the Lorax of the dog world. Um, and I don't know if you've ever read the Dr. Seuss book about the Lorax that speaks for the trees. My goal is really to speak for the dogs. Um, and a lot of times when clients come to me, there's a miscommunication. Um, and it re really, they just need a translator or a mediator to kind of help them understand what their dog is saying and how they can help their dog um, throughout their daily lives. Um, so I really try to always focus on speaking for the dogs and then also helping the owner uh, develop a relationship in which they can enjoy life together because that's what a dog is really supposed to be is an asset to our life something that brings joy to our life and if you're struggling to feel joy with your dog then uh definitely i want to help with that because i want everybody to experience the love the unconditional love and joy that i've received from dogs wow that's uh, that's wonderful to hear it's uh, really our sensitivity to them that really counts and um yeah it's uh, actually amazing to, to just to have them around and um yeah just just seeing them they always there's so much to be grateful for and to thank for for them there's so much to learn from them and um yeah they really do teach us how to be better persons absolutely yeah yeah and um when it comes to um, addressing dog training problems, what approach do you usually use? Yeah, so um, we, first of all, are going to collect information from the owner um, because that's so important. What are the uh, habits and routines that you already have in place between you and your pet? And once we collect that background information, um, then we're going to come up with a plan to help you and your dog start to enjoy each other a little bit better. Um, we do use positive reinforcement methods, mm -hmm. um, which is very important to me. Um, you know, there are trainers out there that sometimes use aversive techniques um, like choke chains or prong collars. And um, that's something we really uh, stay away from. Uh, in positive reinforcement, we are paying the dog for behavior that we want. And a lot of times our currency, our form of payment with the dog is food. Um, for dogs that are less food motivated, sometimes we use toys or play as a reward. Um, but the reward is very important. And uh, when I work with clients, we often refer to the food as a type of currency because just like us, um, we don't really want to work without being paid usually. Uh, that's something that uh, we don't do. And we are technically using our money to buy food. So it's very similar. Um, but oftentimes I encounter people who just expect their dogs to know what's right and do what's right without any form of payment. And that's really what positive reinforcement about is reinforcing the dog in a positive way for behaviors that we want to encourage. Uh, wonderful. And uh, I guess that's really uh, the sure way to go in positive reinforcement affirm affirmations. And it's really something that you need to focus on in order to achieve the best results. And I think it's also the same goes for us humans because we also learn from that more effectively. Because, um, yeah, I. Absolutely. I, yeah, because I've also encountered, you know, being being punished before. And I remember the punishment more than the lesson. And uh, yeah, I guess it also goes the same with the, with animals. We really uh, resonate more, so much more with the benefits that we gain instead of the uh, negative effects or the fear that we can possibly be thinking about from not being able to do something. So yeah. Uh, exactly. Yeah, and, and a lot of times positive reinforcement goes hand in hand with confidence building. 
Right. Um, and confidence building is so important in people and dogs. You know, even with a child, we're going to encourage them to have uh, confidence in different situations. And that really is the goal a lot of times in training as well, is to help that dog feel more confident in those situations. And sometimes that's, that confidence can also be built through the relationship between the dog and, and the person. Because if the dog knows that the human is going to listen to what they're saying, um, that creates confidence in themselves and in the relationship. Wonderful. I love that. Yeah. And confidence and trust that comes with it. Yes, absolutely. I like that so much. And um, by being an expert specializing in dogs, um, what do you see the value in that? Really, it just goes back to, um, you know, helping people and dogs live their best life. Um, because, uh, you know, it's always heartbreaking me, to me to see a dog that is fearful um, and is behaving based off of that fear. Um, and of course, it's just such a, a fulfilling uh, feeling when you're able to uh, help this dog be more confident in everyday life, be less scared, um, and of course, help the, the people be less frustrated because sometimes those situations can be very frustrating um, when you're trying to figure something out, but you may not have the tools to do so. Um, but it, the, the relationship between dogs and humans is a symbiotic relationship in my eyes because uh, they help us uh, feel joy and laughter mm -hmm. and, and we help take care of those dogs. So we're helping each other constantly. Um, and uh, as a child, I really relied on the unconditional love of dogs. And even as an adult, um, the world can be a, a very depressing, scary place. And dogs are just uh, such a positive thing that we've been given in, in life. And so I really just wanna help as many people as possible experience that and help those dogs uh, be as happy and healthy as they can possibly be. Yeah, I guess. Happy dogs, happy owners. So yes, yes. It really uh, just goes back to you naturally because that's how it goes. And um, yeah, and uh, they really bring so much joy and so much to be grateful for for them. I mean, just, just their presence. I really believe that sometimes pets or dogs and even cats are really here and uh, they can be really, they have proven and well, with my experience and with what I see, sometimes they really can they really can prove that they are better than us humans. So they're really here to teach us. Yes, yes. Yeah. Uh, what What are the uh, some of the challenges that you face in in practice? Um. So I would say that um, some of the biggest challenges are just commitment to training. Um. I find that uh, training your dog is a lot like learning to play an instrument or going to the gym. Um, there has to be a level of commitment there. And if you can find time to do it daily, um, that's going to help you see the most success in what you're trying to accomplish. Um, but sometimes I, I just like with going to the gym or playing an instrument, sometimes you have a busy week and maybe you don't practice that week or maybe you have a hard month and you don't practice for that month. But if you don't practice, a lot of times you lose those skills um, or the, the progress starts to plateau because you're not continuing to train. Um, so I find that a lot of clients struggle with, with that commitment aspect of training because there are training sessions that you can do throughout the day, but then training is also a lot of times a lifestyle um, because if the dog is, is you know, has a, a behavioral problem, like say barking, um, that may be happening several times throughout the day and how you respond to it is going to set the stage for a uh, your training and what you're able to accomplish with that dog. Um, but a lot of times I think people come into training and they're, they're very intimidated. Um, they think it's gonna be a lot of work and it can seem like a lot of work at first, but really we encourage our, our uh, students to just stick to like five minute training sessions. And that's really what's best for the dog. Um, 
So if you can even just find like five minutes, one or two times a day to work with your dog, that's going to be really beneficial. Um, the other thing that I think sometimes is hard for people is unrealistic expectations. And that sort of goes back to a misunderstanding of, of how dogs operate, how their brains work. Um, and, you know, sometimes people think, oh, I taught my dog to sit. They did it one time. Now they know how to sit. And that's not necessarily the case because um, dogs have a hard time generalizing. Uh, if we learn to tie our shoes at school, we can tie our shoes on the bus, in the grocery store, on the sidewalk, but a dog does not necessarily operate like that. If they learn how to sit in class, they have to learn how to sit on the street, at the park, you know, and that can be hard for some people to understand that just because a dog does something one time doesn't mean that they have a full understanding of that behavior. All right. Um, I like what you said about commitment. I guess it really starts there. It's really the real foundation to, to everything, actually. So, and uh, if you have that commitment, then that's really what's going to, if you hold on to that, it's what's going to help you move forward and continue with the training and giving your dog the, the best life as possible. Absolutely. And that's why I love um, doing the virtual coaching, because much like, uh, you know, with playing an instrument or going to the gym, if we have somebody to coach us through um, those uh, trainings each week, uh, it's really helpful. And people that work with me also get access to me via email and text message. So sometimes I even have clients texting me throughout the week saying, hey, I did this. Is this OK? okay. Or just sharing, you know, uh, wins like, hey, you know, we were outside on a walk and we saw another dog and he looked right at me when I told him to focus. So uh, sometimes I really think it helps to have that person there that's sort of cheerleading you and help guiding you through the process. Wonderful. So, uh, yeah, aside from commitment, I guess the uh, interdependence plays a key role there because you can't do it alone. I mean, sometimes you really need other people and that's something that's where the coaching comes from. And uh, it's really a big help that you're doing this virtually. So, um, yeah. And what's the process that you go through? I mean, what are the steps that you do when it comes to um, coaching your clients? Yeah, so it really depends on what their goals are. But the first step is to fill out an intake form on the website, um, which just sort of asks some background questions um, mm -hmm. about what you've already done with your dog, what your goals are with your dog. Um, and that's really where I start and sort of formulate my plan for that dog. Um, but typically, uh, we have packages available where you can buy a package. Um, so sometimes I may meet with someone and, and they may ask me, how many lessons do you think it will take for us to reach our goals? And um, then they may purchase a package. And typically, we, we work together uh, each week for an hour. Um, and sometimes where it's a combination of talking through the plan and then uh, putting the plan in motion. Uh, but I really all over the country because it's so interesting to work like, for example, I live in North Carolina, we don't get very much snow, but I have a client in Chicago who, you know, they've got negative degree temperatures and lots of snow. And so potty training a dog in Chicago is much different than maybe potty training a dog in North Carolina because we just don't have that severe weather. So um, I love uh, getting to work with people uh, located in different areas. And it also, I, I found, has been very helpful for dogs that maybe can't handle a classroom type situation. Um, maybe they don't do well with other dogs. Maybe they don't ride well in the car. Um, so virtual lessons are a great option for people with dogs like that. Oh, yeah. And uh, uh, that really goes to show that, yeah, during this pandemic, and it's really a, a good start as well to, to create a business around that and, um, yeah, do virtual calls. Yeah. Yeah. And um, what are your top recommendations in giving dogs a healthy and happy lifestyle? 
Yeah, absolutely. So I think that um, some of the biggest things that I think about when I think about being a dog being happy and healthy is enrichment and decompression. Um, so first I wanna talk a little bit about what enrichment is for animals. Um, and I, it's funny because speaking of the pandemic, um, I thought this was a great analogy and a way to sort of help people understand what enrichment is for dogs. Um, when we had the beginning of the pandemic, a lot of people stopped going to concerts. They stopped going out to eat. They stopped going to football games. They stopped going to the movie theater. Those are all forms of enrichment for humans. It's a way to make our life more exciting and more interesting. Um, eating at home every night is a little boring, uh, but sometimes we go out to eat with friends and that's a form of enrichment for us. So we got to experience what lack of enrichment feels like during the pandemic. It's very boring. It's very mundane. Um, and so when we talk about this with dogs, it's very similar. Um, but the ways in which you can provide enrichment to your dogs are very interesting. So let's just talk about food for a second, right? Okay. A lot of dogs eat out of food bowls and cats as well. Um, and that is the equivalent to me of eating at your kitchen table every night. It gets really boring after a while. Um, so forms of enrichment for meal times would be treat dispensing toys um, or lick mats or Kongs. So feeding them, feeding them out of different toys um, or in different ways is one form of enrichment for dogs. Then of course there's field trips, going to the park, you know, going to a friend's house um, and there's play. Play is a good way uh, to provide enrichment for your dog throwing the ball, playing tug, getting a new squeaker toy. Those are all ways to enrich your dog's life. Um, and the other big thing that I think is important when we talk about healthy and happy pets is decompression. And decompression is something that is very important for humans as well. It's why people go to yoga classes. It's why people meditate. Um, it's why we go for walks in the woods. We are decompressing all of that stress that we have built up from everyday life. And um, for dogs, uh, there are two big ways to uh, decompress a dog. Um, one is uh, walks. So like going on walks with a long lead and we actually call them decompression walks. Um, the benefit is that you're in an isolated area. It's not congested, not a lot of people, not a lot of dogs. And you're just walking through the woods with your dog on maybe a 15 or 20 foot lead. So there's no pressure. They can explore. They can take in the scenery. Um, and they're going to decompress while they're doing that. Um, if people live in a neighborhood that's very congested, sometimes they may just walk their dog around the neighborhood but that may not always be a good form of decompression because they're getting a lot of stimulation from other dogs, other people, cars, neighbors. Whereas if you go out into a more secluded area like a big open field or a hike through the woods, um, it's, it's, it's more decompressing just like it is for people. Um, but the other way that dogs decompress is through their nose, which is very interesting. Um, so dogs see the world through their nose, much like we see the world through our eyes. So they can smell things from weeks ago, you know, way far away. And when they are smelling things, that's how they're really reading the world around them. So a good way to help a dog decompress is by activating that nose. Um, and there's lots of fun ways to do that. So you can actually do a uh, scent work for fun where we hide treats in the house or in boxes for the dog to find. Um, or you can use something like a snuffle mat where you hide their food in the mat and they forage around to find the food. Um, but anytime a dog is using their brain uh, and their nose, that, that nose center of their brain, um, they are going to be relaxing. Uh, and it actually is a really good uh, way to 
tire out a dog that has high energy or is easily overstimulated, mm -hmm. nose work is a great way to help them use their brain, use their nose, and just sort of decompress a little bit. Wonderful uh, enrichment and decompression. Uh, I, I like that and I uh, um, uh, can't wait to implement that myself and I'm, I'm really getting ready to have a dog soon because right now I have, I'm taking care of seven cats with me. So um, oh, wow. we just have limited space, but I really want to be ready to, to have a dog and um, yeah, I'm learning a lot. And you guys in the audience, I hope you're also learning from that in it very simple way that thank you jesse for breaking that down for us it really makes so much sense and um yeah i like what you said i never knew that there's such a thing as decompression and um it's very specific and very um uh custom let's say custom made for for dogs and especially knowing that they really um um yeah they use their nose more mm -hmm. compared to us and uh wow that's it's that's so amazing thing to know and um yeah it's really interesting too because they actually use enrichment in zoos as well and um one of the ways that they provide enrichment for animals in zoos is i've actually seen in the north carolina zoo if you go to their website and there's some videos on youtube about this um they will actually make paper mache animals mm -hmm. uh for the zoo animals and they'll stuff it full of food so say you have an enclosure full of tigers, they're building a uh, paper mache zebra and stuffing it full of food and setting it in the enclosure so that they can somewhat recreate what might happen in the wild. But that's interesting. Um, and the, they actually have a, a team of volunteers at the North Carolina Zoo that help make these. And uh, the other thing that they do is they use scent as a form of enrichment. So sometimes they'll go out in a closure and just sprinkle like some uh, cinnamon. Uh, so it's a different smell for the animals to then go and explore. Nice. Um, yeah, I guess it really boils down to, you know, just caring for yourself and you know, feeling good and reaching for things that really make you feel better. And um, yeah, those are two key points enrichment and decompression yes yeah and uh yeah based from uh, your experiences how can dog parents uh be the key to their dog's happiness really i would say it's just all about being a good listener um i feel like in human relationships that's very important as well if we're not listening uh, it's hard to form that relationship that is based off of trust and um, so, and, and that's where I think a trainer comes into play too, because if you don't have a good knowledge of uh, animal behavior or body language, sometimes you may be misinterpreting what your animal is trying to tell you, mm -hmm. um, but it is possible. I've studied uh, body language and animal behavior. I've coached many of my students to do the same. And it's so uh, fun to hear them you know, telling me these stories of, oh, you know, my dog did this and I realized like he's actually scared. So I changed this and now he's doing better. Um, but it really is about listening, I think is so very important. And if you are unsure how to listen to what your dog is telling you, or you're not sure what your dog is trying to say, that's where a trained professional can really help you start to understand that better. Wow, yeah, it can really be a challenge, especially, well, like for me, for instance, I'm I'm not a very sensitive person, and uh, sometimes it can be really a struggle for, struggle for me to try to, you know, to know what they really feel and what they really right. think and what they need. So it takes effort and practice, but for sure it can be done. Yes, yeah. absolutely. And with help, of course, that's so much better. And um, yeah, um, uh, this question is really for you. Um, how do you feel when you help dog owners who struggle with problems or issues with their dogs that they really can't handle on their own? Honestly, it's, it's the best feeling in the world um, for me because dogs are my passion and I feel like dogs have given me so much in my life. Um, they've given me a sense of security. 
They've helped me find a fulfilling career. Um, so my goal is really just to help give back to these dogs. And every time I have an owner come to me and say that they're so much happier with their dog and with their relationship, it just makes me feel like I'm doing what I've been put here to do. And uh, it's, it's the absolute best feeling in the world for me. Yeah, and that sounds like you're also a visionary having started this company and your, your training programs. And uh, yeah, and uh, I love hearing that. And um, I guess it's really a passion and uh, living that passion that really moves us forward and doing what we're born to do is really the most fulfilling thing. And uh, Yes, and I consider myself so lucky to have found that path and to be going down it. I mean, I don't know that there are many people out there that have jobs that they're very passionate about. So I just feel so grateful to be able to, to do this for a living. Wow, that is, that is so inspiring. And yet, true, uh, not a lot of people have found that, that really, uh, that direction and that really fulfilling um, career or lifestyle. And um, yet, when it's really in you, I guess you, you're really going to get there. And um, yeah. I'm glad to see that in you. And um, do you have any uh, final thoughts or is there anything that you would like to leave our audience with that you think is important? Yeah, I mean, I just want people to understand that training can be fun. And, uh, you know, a lot of times I think people think that that training needs to be uh full of consequences and discipline and um, it, learning can be fun. I mean, and, and that is something that I really want people to understand is that um, training should be something fun. And if it's not fun, then you need to do something differently because, uh, and I love to see that in my clients where maybe they start out and they're a little bit intimidated or insecure, but once they really start to have fun, they can't stop. They're addicted. They just want to keep learning more and teaching their dog more. And, um, I want to help as, as many people as I can, uh, understand the benefits of, of training and how it can help uh, their relationship with their pets. Wonderful. I like what you said about fun, and that's really the, the key there, I think. And uh, it's really just the, the most important thing of all, because when it's when you don't do things for fun, and you might as well not do it. And um, I guess yeah. it, it sounds simple, but it's sometimes the simplest things can be the most profound. And, and, uh, yeah, it's really uh, what really gives us life and um, dogs and even cats. They're really just here because it's really uh, themselves to, to bring joy and to bring happiness. And it's really just so fun to have them around. And um, yes. it's just also what they really teach us to be in the moment, be happy, just be in the present moment and make the most out of it. And you were so right about that. You know, you, you hit a really key point about being in the moment. Um, and that's another thing that I think people struggle with sometimes with dog training is that um, dogs are very in the moment. Um, so if you wait more than two seconds to reward a dog for something that they did that you like, you may have missed that window to reward them for that behavior. And that's why we, a lot of times use clicker training and marker words with mm -hmm. dogs because it creates a bridge between the desired behavior and the reward. Um, but I love that about dogs and it definitely is something to uh, aspire to be more like is just present and centered in the moment because as humans, a lot of times our brains are back here and up here and here. And um, it complicates things sometimes when we're stuck in the past or the future and we really just need to be focused on the present. Right, and uh, that's, there's really so much to be in the now moment. And, yes. Uh, yeah, and uh, yeah, for our viewers who would want to know more about what you do and if you have a free offer for them, uh, can you share it with us? Absolutely. So um, I have a document uh, that talks more about enrichment in depth. 
and actually gives you some ideas for how to start implementing enrichment for your pets at home. So if the viewers would like to send me an email um, through the website or howlingmoonpetcare at gmail.com, I would be more than happy to uh, send them this enrichment document to get started with some uh, enrichment at home with their pets right now. All right. All right. Okay. We'll be uh, posting uh, the uh, details in our page and the links to your to your site. And uh, yeah, thank you so much, Jesse, for being here with us. And Absolutely. A a pleasure. Yeah, it's a wonderful and fun conversation. And yeah, I guess it just goes to show that we really can be the key to our dog's happiness and well-being. And for you guys in the audience, I hope this show has provided value for you. And I hope you learn more about how to simply, easily, and compassionately keep your dog healthy and happy. So I wish you all so much love and a happy life with your fur babies. And uh, we'll see you around for updates and for future events. And uh, bye for now. Lots of love. Bye. Bye-bye. <laughs>